pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, roll call, please. Note for the record that all council members are present. Okay, adoption of the agenda. Is there any additions, deletions, or changes? I move to adopt the agenda. Second. A motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Very good. Got an operating menu. And first thing up is presentations and proclamations. Is a proclamation recognizing May 18th to 24th, 2014 as Public Works Week. <clears throat> and with us tonight, most of our crowd are our staff. And wow, look at them beautiful shirts out there. <laughs> guys, are looking, guys and gals are looking very bright tonight. So I do have a proclamation here that I would like to read because uh, I think it was noted a couple weeks ago eloquently by our former mayor, Ray Miller, of... Uh, how public works is out there just as much as our police and fire department, if not more so. And the only time that you really recognize is when we have a problem. Hmm. And so you've been doing a great job. So since this is uh, recognizing Public Works Week, you know, as we recognize you, at least hopefully you know that we recognize you all the time, but uh, this is a, a special week of recognizing you. Says, okay, <clears throat> this is a proclamation of the City Council of the City of Brisbane recognizing May 18th to 24th, 2014 as Public Works Week. Whereas Public Works Week is a national celebration of the tens of thousands of men and women in North America who provide and maintain the infrastructure and services collectively known as Public Works. And whereas these critical services are provided daily by professionals who serve the public good with quiet dedication, and whereas the Brisbane Public Works Department is responsible for City <clears throat> and Guadalupe Valley Municipal Improvement District, storm drain, sewer, and water systems, all aspects of public roadway, roadway maintenance, traffic signals, public parks, playing fields, and landscaped areas. All public buildings, the Sierra Point Landscaping and Lighting District, the City's Office of Emergency Services, administration of federal floodplain regulations, ensuring compliance with national pollutant discharge elimination system permit requirements, and oversight of the marina. I gotta take a breath now. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> and whereas the theme of the National Public Works Week 2014 is building for today, planning for tomorrow, which recognizes the stewardship and sustainable practices that ensure <coughs> continued quality of life for current and future generations. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Brisbane does hereby proclaim May 18th through 24th, 2014 as Public Works Week, dated this fifth day of May, 2014. And Randy Broa, um, I'm gonna present this to you, but you can remain seated, and hopefully uh, you have a few uh, nice rebuttal words. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to take the, con the time to make some comments, Mr. Mayor. Thank also you. also maybe introduce some of your new staff. Absolutely. And, and thank you for letting me stay here because I think it gives you the opportunity to, to look at your employees. And it was interesting you remarked on Mr. Miller's comments from our last meeting when he talked uh, quite eloquently about how anonymous the public works staff is. Uh, and that's really kind of hard to imagine sometimes when you look at the lime yellow green shirts that they're wearing which you know, are all of your maintenance workers that are out there. And of course, you have your engineers, your administrative assistants, your public works inspectors uh, that are mingled in there as well. But it really is a group of people that makes the system run for you every day. And it's why we live in a, it's all, why we live in a first world country. And people just take it for granted that your water is gonna come on and your sewer is gonna go away. Um, and what's really funny to me is that oftentimes I get taken as the, pub, the face of public works, but I'm more the suit of public works. The people that you see out in the audience in front of you are really the brains and the brawn that makes this thing happen. I'm just kind of a guy that shows up periodically and tells you what sort of resources I need so that I can give to them so they can really make it work. And if your water system breaks in the middle of the night, they're the ones that come out. When the sewage is overflowing, they're the ones that come out. Uh, when people's boats are sinking, they're the ones that come out. When trees are down on the weekend, they're the ones that come out. And the overwhelming majority of our citizens never think about it, and we're really proud of that. But I'm really, really thankful that you're willing to take the time this evening and, and to present them this proclamation. Uh, and as the mayor remarked, there are some people here that are new, 
uh, or at least new to you, not new to me, about a year, perhaps a year and a half ago, the marina was put under public works department, so you may not have seen some of these folks. The administrative assistant down there, Teresa Camara, give us a little wave, Teresa, so we know who you are. A little bigger wave. There you go. You're a small person as it is already. You can stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting next to her is our acting harbor ma master, Chris Zanzius, who's also over there down out at the marina. Sitting next to Chris is Chris Redfield, another Chris right next to him, a full-time employee. Todd Curtis, a full-time employee, been a part-time employee for a long time. You probably know him from his work with our baseball teams around town. In the back row, I see Bob Sage, one of our new full-time employees that we brought on board. And our latest and freshest is uh, Mr. Crockett, Kessel Crockett. Not Dustin, that's it. That's what's showing on his shirt, but he's not Dustin. He's so new, we haven't even gotten him a shirt uh, with his proper name on it yet. So... I guess that just means Dustin's in trouble for a week or two until we get the right shirts. <laughs> so thank you very much for this opportunity, sir. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, maybe if we can just have the whole Public Works Department and staff just stand up because, you know, you deserve a round of applause. So yeah. <laughs> thank you. We do appreciate you, that's for sure. And you too, Romero. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys and gals. Thank you very much. So, <clears throat> Okay. Uh, unless you really want to stay, you can. But if you don't, now's the time to get out. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mayor, do we need to report out from closed session? Um, that's a good question, uh, Mr. City Attorney. Yes. I had a question from Mayor Pro Tem uh, O'Connell if we needed to report out from closed session. Yes, we do, and I'm prepared to do that. Okay, let's go ahead and divert. Thank you. There were a number of closed session items on this evening. The first was a conference with legal counsel, uh, amicus brief on land use issues, and in that matter, direction was given, no action was taken. Second item was conference with legal counsel regarding one case of potential litigation uh, pursuant to government code section 54956.9. In that matter, direction was also given, no action taken. There were two other matters, the liability claims of Ramon Serrano and Fernando da Silva, and in both of those matters, action was taken, and both claims were denied uh, during closed session. Okay, very good. Okay, back to presentations and proclamations. Item B, which is Jerry Lamy of Farmer's Market. Come on up, Jerry. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council members. I'm Jerry Lamy. I'm the executive director of West Coast Farmers Markets. And the reason I am before you tonight is uh, to discuss the possibility of adding a second farmers market to the city of Brisbane. And and uh, so I'm just going to kind of lead into how this has this come about. We've, we've been here for about a year and a half now. And I think that a lot of us have seen the uh, the Thursday market dwindle a little bit, and uh, that has happened um, be because of, of I think of the time, the wind, the cold, and um, uh, you know I think people after a while they, they either get tired of it, um, so a few of the vendors kind of uh, kind of go away. You know they if if the if the foot traffic's not there. The uh, the vendors have a ten tendency to dwindle because there's there's not enough not enough money in it to bring them out. So the thought process for me as I continue to grow my business, which is now two and a half years old, um, we we've, we've grown to eight year-round farmers markets. Uh, this year I've opened two, and I'm in the process of opening eight more. Um, some of the things that I've that I've done in like in San Mateo County, one of the things I'm looking at is we we work really really hard to try to change people's shopping habits, and if we are successful enough to get consumers to come to our to come to one market a week, a lot of times the strawberries don't last seven days. 
they have a tendency to turn in three or four days. Um, you know, the corn is not as fresh six, seven days later. And uh, there, so there's, there's a, a need a lot of times to be able to go shopping more than one day a week. So what I've started to do, and I'm, I'm uh, working on it, where I have a Saturday market in Foster City, I'm adding a Wednesday. In Half Moon Bay, I've got a Sunday, but I'm adding a Saturday there because it's more of a tourist area. Here in, uh, in, in Brisbane, the thought process is the Thursday market would, be, would eventually become seasonal, and it would run somewhere from May to the end of November or about mid-December. The Saturday market would become the year-round market. Mornings here in Brisbane are, are very, very pleasant. The wind is usually not blowing. The sun's out. The birds are chirping, you know. And my thought process is people have a tendency to be off of work for the most part on Saturdays and Sundays. So if we can get them to come and do their shopping on, in Saturday morning from 9 to 1, you know, I, I believe that, uh, that that might be a really good change. I, I wouldn't want to disrupt the, the Thursday market during the peak season of corn, cherries, nectarines, peaches, all the good stone fruit that's out there. And I'm not trying to take away from the community. I'm trying to add to the community. We tried a lot of different things last year by, by trying to add the, the market to Fridays for the, for the concerts. And uh, I think that we were visible. A lot of people saw that we were there. But the sales just weren't there because the people weren't there to do their shopping. They were there to listen to that great music, you know. And so that's something I probably won't try to do again this year. I uh, I just I want to I want to you know basically stay stable, um, but the but the thought process is to serve the city better, to try to get away from the winter in you know in you know the win the winds and the rain at night in the winter, to uh, to take the Thursday market have it become seasonal, but not until I would say like the end of November or maybe two weeks into December. And in a couple of weeks, with the approval of a council, go ahead and open a 9-to-1 Saturday market. And uh, I think that's the reason I'm here, to see what, what uh, the great minds of Brisbane think and, and what, you, what you think I should try to do. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I guess that's uh, asking for our feedback. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. <laughs> council have an opinion on this? Of course. We all have opinions. Okay, Ray, go. Well, we're here, Ray. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I think there's no doubt that, as you know, this council is committed to having a farmer's market, if at all possible. You're my best customer. And we really <laughs> believe in that. So so whatever we say, it's w what we believe is you know, the best for the continuation and success of the farmer's market. So that's kind of where I think we're all coming from here. Um, and I have some doubts about the uh, business viability of this proposal. Can't hear me? Uh, th then the mic must be down or something because I'm certainly talking. Um, so I wanted to have that conversation because mm -hmm. I, I didn't know what your reasoning was. Um, and let me give you a little bit of my reasoning and see how that jives with yours because we know that the Thursday market is, you know, barely making in terms of people are coming and I agree. expenditures and it, it's tight and a number of vendors have left because of that. And so it's a problem. Um, on the other hand, the timing is pretty good in, in one respect. That is, it, it could pick up people who are working in Brisbane during the week, like at the Crocker Park or what have mm -hmm. you. And there are a lot of people work there. Now, how many people are coming from there, I, I don't really know, because not, not everybody I see there I recognize, but that's at least a possibility that when people get off of work, they could, they could stop by there. Uh, when you do Saturday, you know, that particular clientele is, is basically gone. And so all we're really talking about is, is people in town. And the real, you know, committed 
farmers market people are, are, are going to go either Thursday or, or Saturday. Probably not both. Uh, and that's my thought anyway. And so then it strikes me that what we're probably doing is really spreading the potential clients among two markets. And then if we're already operating on the thin margin, you, you split it among two, that's going to kill the whole farmer's market. That's my concern. Uh, and, and I'm really worried about that because we want it to be viable. We want it to continue. Uh, and I, I just don't see where the people are coming from to, to justify, uh, you know, two, two farmers markets in a week. And I think that, uh, you know, we were trying the all year round uh, experiment. And from my point of view, it, it, it's pretty clear that, you know, that's probably not a good idea. Uh, that we probably should do like most farmers markets do and have it seasonal. I would do a little bit different months than you're talking about, but I think trying to do it all year just doesn't work, especially when you have uh, low foot traffic like we do in Brisbane, because what you need to get out are those people who really come up regularly because they, they want to support it and they want it to happen. And, and there's a hardcore of people that are virtually there, you know, every time. But if you split them between a couple of occasions a week, which is what I think would happen, um, then, then we're in even worse shape rather than better. And that, that was kind of my thinking, and I could be wrong about that, but I did test it out with a couple of your vendors. And without telling them what I thought, I just said, so what do you think of this idea? And basically they all said the same thing that I just said. Um, that's, that, that's their view anyway. Now you say, well, maybe they don't understand business or maybe they don't understand the potential market or whatever or how we could market it and so forth. But nevertheless, that's, that, that's the view that I picked up from all, everyone I talked to. And so they're concerned about it as well. And so I'm, I'm sure you worry about that because you got to have the vendors or otherwise no market. Well, and so anyway, that, that was my concern. And, and also the, the, the change of location, I wasn't too keen about that either in terms of uh, convenience and accessibility. Uh, so I, I have a lot of concerns and, you know, if you can convince me that you, this is going to be viable and you think it's going to work, then okay. I mean, I'm not going to oppose things, but I want to make sure that what we do makes the farmer's market a viable, successful enterprise. I appreciate all your opinions and uh, I share your doubt also, you know, but because of that, that's that's the reason that I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to find the right the right mix for Brisbane. Um, to be honest with you, the idea of the Saturday market came from some of my vendors, Sunrise Farms, the uh, the guys that sell fruit right on the, the first ones. Right. They were the ones that came to me and said, you know what, we've talked to the residents out here and they think that we should have this on Saturday. And so I said, you know. That's not a bad idea. Um, when I first started Brisbane, you know, things change. And what's changed for me is that I was trying to be at every market that I, could, that, I, that I opened all the time, every minute. And I already had Foster City, so I couldn't be in two places at the same time. Since then, I've now got three on Thursday, two on Friday, still only one on Saturday, but I'm opening five more. <laughs> And I've got three on Sunday. So the fact is, if I, if I have good enough people that come out and keep things going, um, I don't need to be here, but I try to oversee it, and I still try to visit. The second attempt is to create a different mix of vendors that would still be the, the same products, but different farmers. And so hopefully people coming to shop, I like this, this farm for this reason. I like this farm because I like this farmer. And so hopefully we would get uh, a, a number of people that would, that would support both markets. Uh, you know, I would try to bring in maybe uh, an, another, another bakery that is as good as Crepe Brioche um, and I've got one in mind. It's cobblestone out of Turlock. So there, there are my my company has grown to the point that I've got a lot of resources vendors-wise. The problem is how far will they travel for X amount of dollars? And I share your 
I share your opinion. I share your fears. But I don't know which day is better yet because I haven't tested it. So if we opened Saturday, found Saturday to be the stronger of the two, and and keep, kept with Thursday at least throughout this this year, through the, through the summer season, maybe Saturday would become our one and only market next year, and I w I'd be willing to do that. The only thing that I don't want to do is turn my turn my back on all the city employees and all the business people in town that have been supporting us, you know, on Thursday evening, and so I've thought about that too. And so I don't think there's an easy answer, but I think the best way to proceed is to test it and, and to, see, to see how Saturday would pan out. And that's, that's I was willing to, to put the effort in and, uh, because Brisbane has been great to me. And I, I want to give back and, and try to serve the community the best I can. And so that's, that's the reason behind what I'm attempting to do. Lori? So I also am a, a frequent user of the farmer's market. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I have seen the, the crowds dwindle um, and the weather, the wind does pick up. So I think switching it or, you know, adding a, a Saturday morning market might be a, a very good idea because of the weather here. Um, and, you know, I, I have had fruit go bad or you know get to the point where we run out and it's the weekend and I'll end up going to the store on a Saturday or a Sunday so I, I think that there's a good point to that of people you know potentially wanting to use the market twice a week um, have you considered a market on a Sunday to space it out a little because Thursday to Saturday is only you know a few days I a haven't lot of really given, have Saturday yeah, morning I, I haven't given it too much thought but I, that's that's something that we could do I just have to look into my bag of tricks and see wh wh what I'm going to make my son work and where I'm going to, you know, put him and, and things okay. like that. But, um, yeah, as I could go to Sunday instead of okay. Saturday. Because one thing I'm thinking <clears throat> is, you know, a lot of the people who use the market are our families. And I know my, my family personally, we have our Saturday mornings, like, completely booked. But Sundays we leave open. So, um, you know, it might be a good way to get people who come to the park to use the playground if, you know, the market's right there or across the street, as I understand you're going to locate it um, mm -hmm. on Park Place, correct? I, I think that we, le we lean toward Park Place in order to free up the park okay. for, for the residents of Brisbane. Right. And so that's, that's why we're going to move on to the street. Um, you know, I think that everybody that, that I, you know, we're, we're comfortable with the park. I just, I just want to go with, with the direction that the council steers me. If this council thinks that the street is a better place for us to be and the people could come across, that's where we'll be. If they allowed us to stay in the park, we could. And, uh, you know, as I think about Sunday, I actually, I had three seconds to think now. Um, I, I can't, uh, Sunday could, could definitely work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there, there's pros and cons to Saturday versus Sunday. You know, Saturday gives you, gives people a chance to, prepare meals for Saturday night right. if they're having any gatherings, but Sunday spaces it out and might free up some people, some families that have a lot of Saturday activities. Um, so I, I would be supportive of the, the schedule that you've proposed. I think it's good to continue the Thursday market so that we can um, continue to serve the needs of the business community. Right. And, and also people who um, can't make the Thursday market if they're working late, the Saturday one would provide them, or the Sunday, whichever day it is, would provide them with time on the weekend when they are available. So, uh, you know, I, I thank you for bringing it to our community. I've no problem. Been, it's been really wonderful to be able to just walk and, you know. We've enjoyed being here, and, and uh, thanks thanks to Brisbane, I, I'm in Carmel. You know, I think you guys showed how things can work in a park, and tomorrow night I get to stand in front of them in Carmel and talk about a move to the park. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of fun. Mm-hmm. 
traditional grocery store um, here, knowing that you know, the fruit might go bad a little bit sooner. Same problem. Oh, well, there you go. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, that's us. Hey, really? There we go. <laughs> you know, might uh, you know spur more uh, activity. Um, and you know, spacing the, the days I think is better too. Thursday to Saturday is kind of short, either Thursday and Sunday or Wednesday and Saturday. Um, you know, I like you in the park. I think it uh, adds, adds to the ambiance of, of the whole feel of, of the farmer's market. And um, you know, ever since you came before us, I was you know, always kind of scratching my head, oh, I hope he knows what he's doing because <laughs> I wonder if we can support you because um, this, this is something that I think the town has always wanted, and uh, I think we're, we all feel very fortunate that that you have you know, latched on to us and, and we to you, and, and like um, Council Member Miller had said, uh, we really want to support you, and we want it to thrive and, and be vibrant. So, um, you know, hats off to you to, to, to try and come up with, uh, you know, a, another solution to make that happen. So I, I totally support you. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. And, you know, thinking about what I've been working on, last night I was on the phone for a couple hours with a, uh, a local fish camp captain out of, uh, out of Princeton and uh, telling them that I've got six markets that could really use fish. So she goes, well, you know, I wouldn't mind doing fish, but could I do smoked halibut and, and uh, range-free chicken and lamb and some beef and some duck eggs and all these other things with it? And I go, absolutely. So, you know, that she's looking to come. Um, Coastside Charlie, he's been out. The, our smoked salmon guy with, his, with, with a bad back, he's out recruiting. He's, he's ready to come back. Um, one of the things that, uh, one of the things by, by going to two days, what we would do is we would bring in a little bit different mix of, uh, of different, different farmers and uh, the variety would double. We'd have, we'd have double variety here. And I think that uh, we'd fi we'll find out who the better ones, the better ones are the ones that are going to sell the most. And as we move into next year then, we'll know, we'll know if we made the right decision and you know, a, if a seasonal weekday market and a year-round Saturday market or Sunday market um, is a is a better mix, you know, then I think we're serving the city that much better. And and those those are the things I've been looking at. And I've been I kind of put myself into an expansion mode. And the next thing I got to do is restock all my all my vendors. And what happens a lot of times, Ray, is that. When the when the, the big boys open up for, from the seasonal standpoint, and that's just starting to happen, we have people like D Dalex, our our guy that was selling the meats and everything. He's he's running down the block and going to Burlingame. Last year he had a little bit more help, but his helper passed away. So he you know and he, he it's not easy to go out and find people that are compatible with uh, with with Dimitri. Have you ever? <laughs> If you've ever dealt with Dimitri, so he's uh, he's out looking for some more help right now, and you know our our toffee lady she loves she loves it she really loved it here, but I spoiled her by letting her try a couple other markets, and she found the sales could be better someplace else. So I'm going to try to talk her into coming back at least once a month, you know, and and coming back and taking care of the people that got her started. So there's there's a lot of opportunities like that out there. Terry. Well, I wouldn't want to, to tell you how to run a farmer's market. Um, and so I think that you will know best what works once it, it um, morphs into something else or something combination. And I hope that we can support you enough that uh, you can stay in Brisbane. There's, there's not there's not one person here that hasn't supported me. You guys are all great, and you know my crystal ball is just as good as the next person. It it doesn't work, <laughs> so you know I'm 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 looking to try to serve the community the best I think we can. Well, Jerry, I I certainly like the idea of expanding it. I, I you know of course uh, respect Ray's opinion too. Of looking at it, it uh, um, you know. He, Put a lot of thought into it, but 
I like what Lori's idea about <clears throat> going to Sunday. Kind of, it splits it mm -hmm. a little bit better. But also, you might have a market <clears throat> from folks that uh, do Tai Chi in the morning, and uh, probably have a good 50, 50 people or so. Awesome. And they wind up about nine thirty, ten o'clock, something, something along that line, that they finish. And I know a lot of folks that. Uh, generally you do Tai Chi or more into natural foods and things of that nature and you might right. might have a, a nice little market there that you're able to create. <clears throat> so I think Sunday might be a, a, a more viable alternative. I mean, because, you know, the, to Ray's point, Thursday and Saturday is only two days, you know, yep. kind of splitting the difference <clears throat> there on Sunday and a lot of people are active on Friday or they go out of town, but generally Sunday is kind of a, that down, slower, you know, it take your pace day, at least in Brisbane. Uh, it's just the way it is. So <clears throat> awesome. part of the culture here, I guess. So, you know, uh, I, I certainly would uh, encourage you to try, you know. Is, and, is there a preference from 9 to 1 versus like a 10 to 2? You, uh, probably you, you might, you, you might want to yeah. see what... Uh, what you can get with the folks is the Tai Chi because uh, you might get a very collective, dense group right there, mm -hmm. you know, and when they end their exercise. So uh, uh, that's a, a, lot of, a lot of people focused in one area at one time that have a kind of a common goal. So, you know, they might be a little hungry afterwards. So, you, know, yeah, you never know. I mean, it, yeah. it might be good to, to have some contact with them or through whatever I don't know who arranges for that uh, through the city, but have some conversations with them. You, you can't assume that, like we assumed that people going to the concerts in the park would be interested, and that yeah. turned out to be a good assumption. Uh, and uh, My mistake. <laughs> well, you know, who knows? Yeah. You know? I mean, as you said, it's, a, it's the crystal ball, right. unless you do some you know, solid research ahead of time. And, you know, whether that particular group would be interested in what they'd be interested in, uh, you know, probably need to sort of investigate before you presume anything about it you right. know it is a you know you, we drive by there and there's a lot of people there but whether they're going to go and buy anything and what they're interested in buying that that's another matter yeah awesome and I'll, I'll look into it and as for the time frame um personally I, I would think nine to one would be good because you know for families that do have kids and get up early and get out you know between nine and ten it might be a good place for them to stop on the way to pick up a picnic and some, you know, some fresh fruit before heading out, and 10 o'clock might be a little bit late to catch them. Great. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. Were the other, uh, yeah. the other um, thought is that you know, there are people who go to church on Sunday, uh, and maybe one o'clock is too soon for them. I mean, maybe you know, two o'clock would be better. Right. Because those are all things you have to take into account. Um, so I mean, if the, if you're willing to. You know, to experiment and recognize that, you know, why not work? <laughs> right. No. I, uh, th you know, then we need to be willing to be flexible and see, you know, what we need to do to make sure we don't undermine the, the future of the whole concept. Well, if I was a genius, I wouldn't have shut down Kenyatta College, San Jose City College, and Redwood Shores. So, I, so I've, I've already shut down three due, due to lack of sales. Mm -hmm. But I've got eight that are still working. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I guess my batting average is a little bit better than a baseball player, so. <laughs> so where did the thinking come about moving from the park uh, to the street? Was that from talking with staff or? That came from staff. You know, what, what's the reason well, behind the, that? The issue to get is it clear on all the elements here. Sure. So the issue is on the weekends you have a lot of um, events in the parks and you have people who are um, – uh, setting up and staging for various things that are going to be happening during the day and stuff. So it's just it's just a an issue of of the spacing, uh, given the fact that the this was going to run from you know nine to one or something like that. Uh -huh. Yeah, I don't know. I'm is there any, uh, Caroline, is there any other reasons? Private, yeah, the private rentals of the park. I'm Big sorry, park? what? The, the, what I just said, the private rentals of the park. Mm -hmm. So you, you don't think that there's enough room to accommodate uh, um, the farmers market on you know near uh, Old County Road in the park, and then let the uh, the parties be in the. 
I mean, we can take another look at it if, if you really would like to well, have it in well, the park. I think we kind of identified a day collectively that it would be Sunday and just maybe have staff look at it. You don't have to look at it right now and then, right. you know, well, come I, back and say this is the time we, we agreed on. You know, I, I, while I really want a farmer's market to succeed here, I mean, our, our park really is a recreation opportunity and we don't want to be stepping on the toes of the people that want to use the park as a recreation opportunity. It doesn't necessarily um, mean that it can't be dual use to a certain degree, but you know there are a lot of activities that, that could and should take precedence over a farmer's market because that's the, the use of the park and what it was designed for. So I don't think this is something that we should be deciding um, here tonight under the present context of a proclamation. I don't think um, the people in the audience really have been aware of what, you know, where the location may be, but, you know, if, if that's something that we'd want to consider, we should do that under an agenda item. Okay. Well, I mean, staff can... Yeah, Caroline reminded me that it's it's not just the people who are uh, the, the market, but also the... Um, um, I'm sorry, I got distracted there. Um, the, the trucks and stuff, the, the park on uh, San Francisco and stuff. So it just, you know, there's just a, a fairly large footprint for the um, a farmer's market and then the, cons the conflict with the, uh, the private rentals and stuff. So, I mean, we can take another look at it and you know, and see what else we might be able to do. Uh, but there's, you know, just an awful lot of things to push into the sure. short. Yeah, just, you long. know, you'll, you'll figure it out. I mean, if we're talking Sunday, you know, the post office is closed on Sunday too. So, you know, you might want to look at that opportunity also, you know, that it's adjacent to the park and kind of in sight distance, everything like that, it might increase its viability, you know. And I was curious as to um, who brings in the music sometimes from time to time at this farmer's market and at others I've seen there's some some people you know performing on guitar or singing and I think that's a nice element to bring to it um, we, we bring the music in we we pay that we pay everybody like ten dollars an hour okay. to be out there and uh, we bring them in um, we stopped during the winter for a while but now the music should be returning yeah mm -hmm. so if there's going to be music I think having it on park place would be better because if people are at the park having music of their own or you know it might be a little distracting to have. about all the bands <laughs> <laughs> right um, all right thank you jerry thank you thank you very all right. much <sighs> thank all right, you, jerry. Thanks, thanks very much for coming okay <clears throat> that brings us to oral communications one i do have a slip from uh, michelle salmon Michelle Salmon, Brisbane resident, honorable mayor and council. I would just like to say that I am very upset at the prospect. I'm actually heartsick at the prospect of you selling public land for private enterprise. I don't think that's the way we need to develop the, the economics of Brisbane. And I'm not going to stay to hear the testimonies and hearing and everything else. I just think that it is unconscionable that you would sell the public's land especially land adjacent to the habitat on San Bruno Mountain for private enterprise. And I think it's egregious. And I, I really urge you not to do this. It really is a break of the public's trust. It makes me think, well, someday in the future, maybe you're going to think, or some future council from this president will think it's okay to sell one of the acres property to build public housing or, or something else. I mean, this is public land that was given to the public not to be sold for private enterprise regardless of what your economic development committee thinks is a good idea a few you know thousand dollars here and there in sales tax as opposed to land that belongs to the public and i urge you not to do this thank you okay michelle anybody else wish to communicate under oral communications Prem? Hello, Prime Law, um, Mayor and Council Members, good evening. Um, I'm just pretty much here to discuss a little bit the 
some one of the issues that a lot of people have been talking about, and that's the dirt mounds over on the Baylands. So I just um, came back from work on the Brisbane shuttle and jumped out here a little bit too early, so I went over to the House of Tai, came right back. So anyway, um, I just want to make sure that um, when considering how tall these mounds are going to become and continue to build, that um, our city isn't overly influenced by Universal Paragon Corporation. I do realize that Universal Paragon Corporation, or UPC, um, contributes a substantial amount to Brisbane's general fund, approximately 13 percent, um, if I understand correctly from the article in the Luminary. <laughs> um, no? So what is it? Okay. <laughs> That's what it said in the Luminary, so I'm just... Uh, Did you read the last one? No. <laughs> Okay. All right. So, um, so you, you can correct me if that's completely wrong. But it's completely wrong. Okay. So if I thought I corrected it in the last luminary. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I just pulled that one up, and if that's wrong, that's wrong. But I just want to make sure that our city doesn't become overly dependent upon um, any one organization, whether it's UPC or anything else. And um, that is just my main concern, because if we lo lose control of oversight with regard to those dirt mounds or anything else um, with regard to SunQuest property and its um, evaluation of the toxicity of the materials being used, um, then I think we have, we'll get ourselves into a, a difficult situation. So that's pretty much what I want to say. Thank you, Brim. Anybody else wish to? speak under oral communications? You, you might want to say that the item's not on tonight's agenda, Clark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> an item's not on tonight's agenda. So. <laughs> so we just had two speakers, but one had to leave, and Prem, that's okay. I haven't been here in a while. On Item's not on the agenda? Okay, now, now we don't have any hands. Good point, Clef. Thank you. All right, in that case, uh, we'll move on to the consent calendar. So anybody wish to remove anything from consent calendar, or do I get a motion? Or? Move approval. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second, and we only have two items uh, on the consent calendar. One is the monthly investment report, and the other is adopt the following resolutions regarding Sierra Point Lighting uh, Landscape and Lighting District, which is resolutions number 2000-10 to 2000-12 that's basically appointing the attorney uh, engineer and describing the improvements and this will come back to us at a later date so this is just the appointment of those individuals so we have a motion and a second any further discussion all in favor aye, aye. Opposed? okay all right, <clears throat> brings us to old business, which is item A, consider approval of a purchase and sales agreement with South Hill Properties, LLC, for real property described as Lot 1, Block I, near 2001 South Hill Drive. Staff report, please. Honorable Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members, good evening. I thought I'd come up to the dais this time since we have a lot of very large-scale photographs that are in the staff report, and if you want to talk about them, I think they'll be better projected if the overhead projector does it, rather than trying to scuttle back and forth rapidly through the iPad. Okay. So uh, I primarily want to do is give you a discussion about the things that have been changed, the questions that we've attempted to answer based on the questions that arose during the last time when the Council heard this. Uh, the first item is that there was a requested change in the agreement language. There was a concern brought up that the buyer was not going to notify us before performing maintenance in the concrete V-ditch. They had a requirement in there to do it. So what we've done is we've included language in that agreement that says they have to notify the public works director and get our consent to the work they're going to do before they do it. So we hope that satisfies that concern. The second question is really in response to a series of conversations about what sort of future trails might happen out on San Bruno Mountain. So what I've included in the staff report are a number of copies. Number one, there's a single copy of the San Bruno Mountain Master Trail Plan that's been provided. And then what we've attempted to do to the best of our abilities is to, because it's at an odd scale and we have drawings, we have orthodigital photographs of the mountain. So what we've done is brought those to as close a scale as we've could and made an attempt to overlay that future trail that's closest to where this parcel is 
onto that. And really what it shows is that that parcel, or the trail rather, is quite a bit back. It's quite a bit westerly of the V-ditch and above that steep slope leading up from it. So it's not very close to this at all. The next uh, question and the thing that we were asked to bring back to you was information on the building permit. And you can <coughs> see that there are six different drawings about the building permit. And the planning director is here. He's going to be able to answer any questions that you might ask about that. Thank you, Sherry. The next thing was a series of photos and also Google photos that are images of existing conditions. We heard a lot of comments about what that land is, what it might be used for in future. You'll recall that Mr. McIntyre, the executive director of San Bruno Mountain Watch, offered his opinion, his personal opinion, that the land was really not of ecological value. And so the photographs that are in your staff report really show you that there's, you know, the non-native railroad ballast that is really what's prevalent throughout here. And there was conversation about some of the trees and such. And you'll see that very, very many of the trees in the photos are actually being choked out and are in a condition where they're, they're dead or dying right now. And the, uh, the next question that we tried to answer, there were comments uh, about the fire prevention plan check and as to whether or not there was a fire code setback or such. There was not a fire code setback in there. There's a zoning setback that I think the planning director can speak to. And I did list the, uh, the four comments that the fire marshal and his staff listed when they went through their review of the building. And that is they had to, the applicant had to show a comprehensive fire department access plan. In other words, access for the firefighters and their equipment. They had to show exiting from the building, personnel exiting from the building, water flow data as far as their fire sprinkler lateral line, and also they were going to be required to upgrade the fire sprinklers and alarms to the current National Fire Prevention Association standards. And the very last thing that staff put here that we were asked to do was council had asked us, well, what would we do with the funds if we did approve this sale and, and what sort of process might we develop? So what I've listed in there is that it's my opinion, my recommendation to you, that the council should direct your appointed bodies to develop a proposed list of uses, including budget amounts, as candidate projects for you to consider at a future date. And it was my opinion that you should direct this to the Complete Street Safety Committee, you should send it to the Open Space and Ecology Committee, and you ought to send it to the Parks and Recreation Commission. And I had thoughts that you might want to provide guidance to those committees in that commission that the projects that are going to be brought back to you, you will evaluate them and you're going to use that based on their expected contribution to development of trails, access to San Bruno Mountain, improving pedestrian conditions throughout the city, and any other criteria that you might deem appropriate if and when we do decide to go through with the sale, or if, if, if we do, not if we don't, that you would send it down to them and say, these are the things that are going to be important to us, so we want all three of you, because you, they, there is sort of a holistic approach to it. All three of those sort of have different pieces of what they might want. You'll remember that Mr. McIntyre suggested that if we were going to sell the land, that we ought to use the, the proceeds from that sale only to purchase land of equal or higher habitat value. So that's something. Certainly open space, an ecology committee might want to offer an opinion on that. There might be some particular parcels they would might want it directed at. <coughs> one of the biggest conversations we've had here is whether there's access to trails. Um, and really the one trail it provides best access to is, is this sort of the non-trail because Crystal Cave is not a trail that shows up on San Bruno Mountain Trail Plan anywhere. I'm sure most of us have violated some rule of, of the mountain when we've been up on it, but just about all of us, I'm sure, have, have been up to Crystal Cave because it's a really fascinating little walk and it's a great little place um, once you get up there. But that certainly seems like something that Parks and Rec would do. We talked a little bit uh, about some previous work that the Parks and Rec Commission has done and how they've talked about providing maps and providing trailheads and providing better access to the mountain. So that's something they might want to focus on. Uh, and the last piece is really the, the newest form committee that you have, the Complete Streets and Safety Committee, because so much of what we're talking about is how do people get around. And whether they're going from their house to maybe a transit stop or whether they're going from their house to the mountain, it seems like maybe maybe some of this money could be spent doing a pedestrian master plan throughout the city. You know, where is it that people want to come and go to? And we've had different conversations about Alvarado to Tulare. We've had different conversations about what's the best place uh, to get to San Bruno Mountain. We've talked about what's the best place or what's the proposed place for when San Bruno Mountain uh, master plan gets developed. So I think we should put these together. We should look at those. I suspect that what's going to end up happening is if you approve the sale and if we get this money, we're going to have way more candidate projects with a much higher cost uh, than we're going to than we're going to uh, be able to obtain from this. But that's good news. I think if we can do something that that provides people a value. The comment that staff has made on this on repeated occasions is that this trail dead ends. 
right now. The piece of it, this spur that we're proposing to, to sell, that we're suggesting that you might want to sell, ends at the next property. And while it's physically possible to go across that, it's only possible to do that by trespassing. That, that owner hasn't granted permission to do that. And in fact, that owner bought that parcel back in 1905 based on a requirement of the city. The city required that owner as a condition of their building, their building and expanding it to provide more on-site parking. And to do that, he had to buy land. So that's what happened. Uh, it's just, it's happened. It's it happened many, many years ago. And this is a circumstance where we're dealt with right now. We, we as staff still think that there are other opportunities to take some revenue from this sale and to provide better access for the people of Brisbane to get to the mountain and to really enjoy it. And so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions or bring up any slides or photos you'd like to look at. Council questions? Anybody? No, I'm fine. Terry? Um, I had sent a couple questions to staff earlier and what um, what I had been concerned about in the prior discussion was the <clears throat> not only the maintenance of the v-ditch and the appropriateness of uh, the or the possibility of wetlands restoration or um, hydrology impacts and so I think that with the change that we did get a little bit more access to the ditch itself but only at the um, actual site of where the the catchment basement is <clears throat> and I had tried to convey and I guess I didn't do a good job um, that I was trying to get an easement that ran the length um, more a length of the actual v-ditch so that there could be access um, that didn't really come out in the you know in the uh, utilization of the changes in the contract. May I ask a clarifying question, ma'am? Mm -hmm. Just, I'm trying to make sure I really understand what your intent is. So, is this in, in regards to um, being able to create some sort of future V Creek, like we've done back along Cypress? Is it? That's is one that of the your are, one so of the, the things. Yes. That? Okay. Um, that is, and and I was glad that we got the explanation about the fire buffer not being an issue. Um, looking at the other. Um, the other property, it, it is obvious that, that that is, you know, taken over and, and we don't have an easement across that. And so the tr trail is forced to dead end. Um, but one of the, for me, one of the beauties of what we have in the rails to trails or the old railroad spur lines is, you know, the continuity and that it gets people off the street and onto an adjacent area mm -hmm. and so um, I hated to even contemplate giving up those those recreational opportunities and the um, so um, I appreciate the uh, the thought that we would get an opportunity to see what V-ditch maintenance they were going to do before they did it or put in, impose V-ditch maintenance. But um, I was thinking more of the enhancement or the access to be able to do something with the V-ditch originally. I, sure I appreciate no no I really appreciate those comments ma'am I, I have to be honest I didn't capture that um, in your remarks at our last meeting and I apologize if I missed that I, I think it's fair to say that that V ditch has already reverted back to a natural state at this point in time you you could barely walk through it right now it doesn't look it, it's not the uh, the LA river of concrete as you walk through it it's really really overgrown unfortunately it's overgrown uh, with some natives as well which I'd like to see come out but, but that's one of the interesting things that I think we've talked about before, like we've seen what's happened at 100 Cypress by putting some of that native material that was planted there uh, intentionally. And it, we've really seen an improvement in water quality at the far end of that. And we already see that improvement in the water quality at the West Hill Detention Basin. I mean, I'm sorry, the South Hill Detention Basin as a direct result of the fact that it's kind of overgrown and there's really sort of been a lack of maintenance on it. But it, 
the vegetation is doing exactly what it should be doing. It's become a wonderful filter. So I, so I think we're, we're kind of there already. Um, so I don't know how to respond to your question about, or what I think your question is, is, is w would there be a way for us to go back if we wanted to really, really restore it to native if, if the property owner wanted to do that? Well, I, I would I, suppose I, I, that if we asked him to at some future date, as long as it didn't in, increase his maintenance financial responsibility, that that might be an agreement we could come to. Well, I, uh, my concern was that if we only have access to say, yes, it's clear or it meets our standards instead of actual access, and, and the only additional access was a little bit more access right at the catchment basin itself was what looks like it changed on, on the contract map. Um, and so that would have made me more comfortable with it if we had retained some of the access so that even though we may dead end at this point, mm -hmm. there's always the chance that we could find a way around that access point that that was sold out from without our knowledge before right. we knew that that could be a trail yeah. um, so I, I that was my concern originally understood thank you you know Clark I I, I, I do have a couple of uh, things I was gonna but you know the other council members are, are you finished Terry or do you want Randy to respond further to that or? um i'm not sure but also i just wanted to make a comment um that randy also when i asked about the the existing trail maps that um you know that this map appears to go through property that we don't own and that the county doesn't own so the proposed trail going up still doesn't have an easement to be able to do that trail either it's a true statement. That's, that's correct. Cliff? Yeah, you know, uh, Randy, you know, he had uh, asked the council if, um, if we wanted to see some photos. And, and you know, I'm just, I was going to wait until maybe after people spoke. But, you know, I thought it might be good to, to bring up a couple of pictures. So this one here. Is there a label at the bottom? I'm sorry, sir. Is there a label uh, at the bottom of it? Well, it's planning three. Planning three, okay. So, um, and it shows some landscaping. So the, 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 the landscaping to the right, the large chunk of, of, of land. Right. Yes. So, um, do you have a, an idea, a percentage of, of what, um, that piece is I, compared to, uh, I'm going to refer that to my colleague in the planning department, sir. John. <laughs> And the question is the amount of square footage or what what's well, just kind of like a, a rough estimate of percentage of of land that we are selling or potentially selling to um uh Kenchi and then that will then be um designated as as landscaping I don't have any acreages on on that area um so I don't, I don't have that information at my fingertips. Okay. I mean, it looks like a decent size amount. And, and um, were you planning to um, have like some kind of requirements in regards to that particular area for the type of um, landscaping that, that could be planted? That's correct. That would be, they'd actually need to landscape that to meet their code requirements for, you know, minimum site landscaping. Uh, it includes both a uh, screening segment along the frontage and then there's also some area of um, uh, stormwater filtration that's in that bed as well so it'll serve both those functions of screening and and uh, stormwater filtration okay and do you think that there's um, any type of of plant material that is native to san bruno mountain that would serve those uh, uh, requirements there's certainly a palette of materials. Uh, I believe they're looking at, uh, I think the planting plan showed manzanita along the frontage uh, in particular. Um, I'd have to look at the actual materials that will provide the, um, the filtration aspect. Uh, you know, again, there's um, some more precise requirements of 
the drainage and other requirements to actually have that material function properly. Uh, again, there are there are good materials through the county uh, in terms of which uh, planting materials are are suitable for that purpose, as well as for the HCP, you know, um, planting materials that are appropriate, non-invasive uh, for this location and proximity to habitat. So, but but it's not part of the HCP. Uh, that's correct. But we would utilize the same sort of requirements. We don't want invasives there. We want things that are okay. uh, native and in, in in nature. So. Okay. So there's. Um, would that be part of the conditions of approval? <coughs> I guess that um, that type of landscaping would be done. That would be part of the landscape plan review, correct? Okay. Good. And then um, just the other um, photo of the San Bruno Mountain State and County Park Master Plan. So it's this one here. So um, so this this is your best rendition, Randy. Of, of where you think that uh, trail might be? Uh, yes, sir. This was uh, me breaking out my crayons and, and overlaying two maps that were at different scales to each other. Okay. Right. And then so um, in the circle area, I guess that's the trailhead? <coughs> yes, that's uh, correct. So where, where is that? The Right near the current access road to the quarry. Okay. So do, do you think that, that part of this trail is the quarry road? Yeah. I believe it is. Right? I, I believe it's always been part of their plans, right? Okay, sort of okay. and then it gets to a certain point, and then it cuts in, cuts up into the map. Kind of winds to the right, and then it cuts back to the left a little bit, right? Okay. You know, that one notch that's just south of um, this property is, um, is that close to the um, that water, de water uh, detention area? That notch, yeah. Yes, yes. That's, that is close to the detention basin. Detention basin, yes, okay. Close to the detention basin, correct. Oh, okay. So, and if you've been up there, I mean, that's a really, as you get to our detention basin, you look, you could see why, because it's really incredibly steep slope. It's really thickly encrusted with all sorts of vegetation. So it's it putting is. the trail up on the top of it. And so you're not on a very steep side slope. It's, it's looking for a fat, a fatter, a flatter spot at the top of it. Right. Got it. Okay. <clears throat> all right. All right, thanks. Sir? That, that's it, Mr. Mayor, so far. Is that it, Cliff? Mm hmm Lori? So I had a chance to ask um, a bunch of questions and get answers. Is that me? Technical difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> um, Electric personality on the microphone, perhaps. <laughs> and and I, was, I was happy to see that there's the, um, you know, written into the agreement as we had requested in the last meeting about any that, that there would be um, review and approval um, by the city before the V ditch is maintained and cleared out. Um, and I had asked about the landscaping, um, and my understanding is that it would actually um, enhance the landscaping because it would provide additional screening and, as you said, um, filtration, and that there would be a a landscape ma maintenance agreement so that if this property is ever sold um, this would you know these requirements to continue this landscaping would, would run with the land and any future property owner would still be bound which which I think is you know it's good to know um, and one um, question I had was about the fire prevention so looking at the the plans um, submitted to the planning department there's the this um, approximately 10,000 square foot property addition mm -hmm. which comes pretty close to the V ditch and as I understand it there's no setback requirement so what what um, is this property owner going to do in terms of fire prevention um, since there's no setback and this might be a question for the fire chief so deputy Chief Johnson might want to answer what the uh, equipment ingress and egress is on that. Uh, Council Member Lou, uh, in the final analysis, the setback for fire will be about the same as it is now. Okay. Um, but is there? It'll be. It'll come closer to the to the mountain and and to the di to the V. It'll be. It'll be closer to the the toe of the mountain. Yeah. But the <clears throat> property line to the vegetation will be about the same distance. Okay. Okay. 
Um, and then um, I actually, I, I met with um, Ken from Mountain Watch um, and we had a meeting uh, last week actually with city staff. Um, he had asked if we could meet and he wanted to talk about some potential ideas um, for providing access uh, to, to people who wanna get access to the trails for hiking. And initially we talked about, you know, well, what if we could put an easement on the property that we're considering selling that goes like through the parking lot, maybe adjacent to the V-Ditch, like a five foot strip for walking. Um, and we talked about how, you know, once you get to the end, you're gonna reach the property that, you know, we don't longer have. And the grade is quite steep on the other side of the ditch that pedestrian access we, we thought would just, wouldn't really make sense. So the idea that you know we, we sort of all talked about um, was providing access at the end of that other street. Is that Park Hill Place? West Hill, West Hill Place, Place, excuse me. Um, and, and Randy had suggested um, potentially getting you know seeing if that the the property owner at the end of that street would um, allow the city to have an easement, an access easement for pedestrian access, and then putting street parking at the end of that street for the public. So I, I, I like that idea and, and it sounded like from what Ken said that the trails that were actually accessible were the ones that led from the, from the end of the road um, out towards Wax Myrtle. Wax Myrtle. Um, he thought that those were more likely to be developed in the future um, and would, more be, would be more likely to be used than potentially the ones going up the steep grade to Devil's Arroyo and Crystal Cave. Um, so I, um, those are, that was just some of the conversations we had. Um, and you know, I, I'll save any other future comments to after the public has a chance, but thanks. Ray, you have anything to add? Um, I have I, my questions have been answered. Uh, I mean, I have comments and views, but I think we should have public uh, testimony uh, before we start deciding how we're going to proceed. But uh, I had a couple of questions, and they've all been asked. Okay. <clears throat> I do have a couple of slips here. Uh, first one is Renee, <coughs> Renee Marmion. Good evening. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Renee Marmion, and I'm also the chair of the Park and Recreation Commission, and I'm a citizen. I am in favor <clears throat> of your consideration for approval of the sale of property. I hope you would also consider for approval of the funds you, re you will receive, or partial funds, this sale will to be put into a master trails development plan. With a master trails development plan, the Park and Rec Commission could maintain, improve, enhance, and continue our walkways, Crocker Trail, Quarry Road, and future public trails. These trails help tie people to their destinations. These walkways provide a safe and easy access to other streets where there are no sidewalks. We need a plan to partnership the businesses with Crocker Trail. We have no public trails in a real way that connect us. With this master trails development plan, we could better access our greatest resource, the San Bruno Mountain. Envision this, trails that you can walk on, jog on, ride a bike on, push a stroller on, Motorized wheelchairs could access these. You could enjoy your trails in your own hometown. You could be connected. You could get to your destination. I hope this will put some thought behind your decision tonight, and I would also like to convey something else to you that a very wise person said to me recently, and that is, we have more in common than we do in differences. Thank you. Thanks, Renee. Okay, I have next slip from Tom Heinz, and Tom is also submitting a letter from 
down at Dilworth. Good evening, Council. Um, I'll do my statement first. Once again, I'm here to speak about the acquisition and privatization of public land by confiscation. It's rearing its ugly head again. Even if the city attorney says it's okay, I once again suggest you seek a second opinion. We've had public trust attorneys here to speak to you about doling out public land public property, our property. If need be, I can bring them back to speak to you again. Or I can point you to videos of their testimony. I'd hate to see the city spend needless uh, dollars on a lawsuit that could be prevented. When I look around this room, uh, not only tonight, but, but other evenings as well, I see many familiar faces. I'm speaking about out here. Other than those being paid to be here, these familiar faces are the people that care about Brisbane. They are your constituents. They helped you, they helped put you in office, believing in you to carry out and uphold their values. They keep coming back to let you know when you're on track and when you're off track. They are the canaries in the mines. They're not your enemies. Listen to them. Yes, the lot next door was sold, perhaps by a council not, not as enlightened as you. Let me ask each of you, if every single square inch of your yard is filled, My assumption is probably, like most of us, no. Perhaps you're planning to put a fruit tree in that far corner in the fall or a larger garden next year. Just because this parcel of land is not currently planned doesn't mean we don't want it. It's public land. Do your children know that you're about to give away public land? We're not suggesting the bakery leave Brisbane. They want to expand, fine. There's plenty of vacancies available in Crocker Park. We don't want public land going to private enterprises. That's why it's called public land. Especially at this bargain price. You know, that was the cost of a conforming lot in central Brisbane 10 years ago. This land is so much more valuable, and if you can't come up with something positive with this public land for our children's children, then reject this proposal, and we'll wait for a council with vision instead of giving away for pittance our public land. Public land for sale without public approval? Something's wrong with this picture. In a democracy, at least this is what I teach in the high schools, elected officials represent the public. Am I teaching them lies? The way I see it, if you grant them our public land, you are admitting we don't have a democracy here in Brisbane. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. No, I'm Dana Dilworth. <laughs> Changing hats, sir. Voice. Wait, let me. Uh, um, to the city council, I ask that you consider not selling our public land. There are many reasons, many already stated, but the primary one is that the location of this property is adjacent to rare and endangered species habitat 
subject to HCP regulations. If you take the Google bird's eye map and zoom out from the staff <coughs> report position, you will see that this property is in the watershed of three ravines coming together. When this rail spur area had been abandoned and before the group removed the metal from the abandoned rail line, the native plants that had returned to the area were, and excuse my um, pronunciation, Gaia elliptica, Cyanophis thyristiflorus, Orthocarpus floribundus, and native rushes in the stretch from Dolby building to the Shenki buildings. The native birds observed were quail and turkey vultures. You have not properly reviewed the environmental quality and value of this property. There were frogs in and near the man-made detention basins, and the public would like to see these natural features remain and be enhanced, not considered unplanned and underutilized. This is another case that neglect from the city means the environment suffers. We do not want this wonderful area turned into a parking lot. This is just for parking? Have other alternatives been considered? Have other parking plans been considered, like three-tier lift racks, parking off-site, or expansion towards the street, two-story, not single? What a sad day when you can't see the environment before the greed. You have undervalued the property in many ways, and would like, we would like for an independent appraisal before any sale takes place. Keep in mind, the citizens have the right to referendum and redress. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tom. Anybody else wish to speak on the matter? I don't have any more slips here. Not seeing anybody? No takers? Okay. Let's bring it back to uh, council. Okay. A couple of questions. Probably. Um, it's from Dana Dilworth's letter, and it's probably for you, David. <clears throat> is uh, you've not properly reviewed the environmental quality or value of this property? Is that something to be reviewed? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Certainly, in in looking at whether to proceed with a with a sale of a piece of, of, of property I mean one of the the issues that the the council would look at would be the value to the city the environmental value but it's it's not the same thing as uh, environmental review under CEQA which would be a project the city would be undertaking or someone else would be undertaking so I, I don't have the letter in front of me uh, to the extent that there's an, a request or uh, an allegation that there's a requirement for CEQA, uh, full environmental review before this is, is undertaken. Uh, I don't believe that that's correct. However, certainly the environmental value of the property uh, to the city is something that is one factor among all the factors that the, the council considers in whatever action it takes. The second one is, is um, the, last, the last sentence in Dana's letters. Uh, did the citizens have a right to referendum and redress on this if a sale goes through, if the council votes for a sale? You know, I'd, I'd, I'd have to take a, take a look at that. I, I don't, this is not a, a legislative action. I mean, this is the, the approval of a, of a sale. Um, I'd have to look at that. I couldn't answer that without taking a look at it. Council clarifications before we get into discussion. You know, I just got. I'd like uh, just to have everyone look at uh, these two photos here. Just want to get some clarification. Okay. It's on uh, photo three, Randy. So, sure, if we could put that back up. <laughs> Sorry about that. W what's it named? Photo, photo three. three. Photo three. 
So it says the it's... The clerk tried to give me a flat tire. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it says it's the view from south end of parcel looking northwards towards Shanky building. So um, is this the this the area that would be landscaped that uh, we looked yes. at the previous map? Yes, this is the area that's so. just north of where you access the detention basin now. So this area actually could be enhanced with San Bruno Mountain natives that would be appropriate for doing some of the uh, uh, type of, um, like, I guess, water flow issues that you were talking about and some of the other things. Let me be careful <laughs> about how I answer that question for okay. you, sir, because so part of the challenge with having to provide on-site infiltration and detention right now per the requirements of the Regional Water Quality Control Board is that you have to have certain flow rates through there. Mm -hmm. And there are certain plants and there are certain materials that have been tested and they're demonstrated to do that. I don't know how many of them are necessarily native. Um, so what we're going to want to do is make sure that they meet the requirements of the board, which is to retain and treat a certain amount of water. So that's why I'm, I'm hesitating a little bit. I don't want to give you... No, I understand that. Definitive okay. yes when I'm All not right. sure that's the answer to your question. But this area here that's green and that's open, it's going to stay pretty much. It's going to be enhanced. That, that's be, part of the area enhanced. that they're going to have to do a professional planting plan on. Okay. And then uh, photo number four. So that's uh, this shows the uh, water retention basin entryway. Yes, sir. That's the driveway leading into it, correct? Okay, good. So then. Photo four and photo three are then connected to each other. Right. Is so if you went if you went through that gate with that very effective chain and the two bollards there, <laughs> yeah, I believe you could dr jump that curb in a Prius, right? But if you went through that very secure chain gate and turned to the right, that's where the previous photo was taken from. Got it. And looking oh. in that direction. Okay. So if if you're on the street and you're looking at what we see right now. Mm -hmm. um, and the council decided to move forward with the mm -hmm. selling of the property and the owner did the remodel, did their parking lot, this green view would still stay intact. It's going to be It'll enhanced. Be enhanced. It'll be enhanced, correct. But I mean, right. it, so some green, of the, you know, the non-invaded, the yes. non-natives that are there, I mean, you but, I mean you're still, still going to see a, a green. It's still going to be green. That's absolutely correct. Yes, sir. Okay. That, that, that's, that, that was it, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Thank you, Randy. Certainly clarification. Any other council clarifications? Okay, let's... We'd be happy to come <coughs> up. Would you like to see any more photos? <laughs> okay. We could bring the lights up, Sherry, and... and uh, start our lively discussion. <coughs> okay, who wants to go first? Don't jump out there. Let's we'll start from this then, Lori. <laughs> um, let's see. Well, as Cliff had just mentioned, you know, I think the fact that the landscaping is going to be improved, it'll actually provide additional screening from the street um, and perhaps better filtration for the water detention basin. Um, I, I would be in favor of this sale. Um, in terms of access, I, I would like to see the city look into an access easement on that last property at West Hill Place um, and putting in parking to see if we could still have a way for people at wanting to access the trails to do so. Um, and in terms of um, providing guidance for candidate projects, I, I like the, the the process that Randy has laid out, um, and I think that not only can we look at enhancing trail access, but also um, looking at connectivity throughout town. Um, maybe we want want to consider using the funds towards um, you know building additional stairways, um, staircases, as Ray had mentioned on the Alvarado side of town in central Brisbane, or um, I've heard some talk about um, maybe paving the Crocker Park um, recreational trail um, if people feel that it's not being used with the, the, um, the gravel right now um, in order to provide um, 
more pedestrian friendly ways for employees <laughs> in the park to you know get some exercise on their mm -hmm. breaks um, so uh, you know I, I would I I think working through these three committees makes a lot of sense and I I like that you know we wouldn't be forming a separate committee but we would be having each of them give us their input based on you know what they're looking at um, so um, I, those are my comments okay Ray? Yeah, well, it, would, um, it would be my view that and when we um, <clears throat> allow the sale of something that's in public ownership, uh, we want to make sure that the, the proceeds from that sale uh, go into something that has uh, equivalent or greater public value. So it's 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 not a I don't see it as a loss uh, if we proceed to look at it that way then we could even gain in uh, service and assets and so forth for the for the public and for the community and it would be my view that in this case the statement that Ken McIntyre made that um, the funds should go into something that provides something equivalent of ecological value. I like that phrase, and I think that's an important part of our decision. And then I would even maybe be more specific as to what we might mean by that, because after all, we've acquired this land uh, as a part of the abandoned railroad legislation, and that really uh, is interested in the development of trails. And that's what that legislation is about and so I would almost go so far as to say that when we get this the funding uh, uh, comes through uh, from the sale then we should really dedicate it to that realm of you know public trails uh, and we have those advisory committees to, to decide whether there should be a, a master trail or it should be um, an acquisition of an easement like Laurie was talking about or, or whether should be maybe some easements uh, for the trails on the mountain because there are some trails on the mountain that go through private property as well and so it might be the way to get access there if the people refuse to sell is to is to gain easements that sometimes you can acquire through purchase so I think there are a variety of, of trail possibilities that would be ecologically important to the community. And it does seem to me that it probably doesn't really include a complete street safety committee. I think the two groups that are most into what I was just talking about are the open space and ecology and, uh, and parks and recreation, because they do trails, as both of those groups do. And not, not the complete street safety committee so that's how kind of I'm thinking about it and and I think we want to you know enhance um, public facilities for the community and and that's how we want to conceptualize this and that's how we want to stipulate so we make sure that that's what happens uh, with the funds that we acquire okay Cliff You know, one of the things that was said uh, tonight about about selling public land, you know, that it is a, whenever you do something like that, you have to make sure that you're doing the right thing and that you're evaluating the options that are out there. And I don't think anybody on the council would take that lightly whatsoever. Um, you know, I, I didn't ask uh, uh, staff to put up the picture of of the part of the parcel that would be turned into a parking lot that would be part of I guess the uh, the the remodel of, of, of the property but it, it's it's in pretty bad state you know Ken McIntyre the executive director of, of Mountain Watch stated as such that the habitat value is is low um, so then if so if if, if we're going to move forward with with the selling of this property as councilman councilman miller had mentioned 
and also Councilwoman Liu, that you know the money should go towards something that is, you know, that makes things better. And is that uh, purchasing some acres in the Brisbane Acres to get better habitat? Is it working towards, uh, you know, enhancing our trail system? Uh, as uh, as uh, Park and Rec Commissioner uh, Renee Marriott, uh, you know, talked about, you know, here we have this Crocker Park Trail, but the accessibility of it is is not very good, and this is where this parcel is being sold. Uh, you know, if you're someone who is in a wheelchair, if you're someone who wants to ride your bicycle, you you you, you can't be on that trail. Um, you know that the. And so, you know, you want to think of ways that you can make it better. Um, you know, the, our city engineer talked about, you know, bringing this, this matter, if we do sell the property, to our Park and Rec Commission, our Open Space and Ecology Committee, and our, our, our Complete Streets uh, Committee. Um, you know, I, I do think that the Complete Streets uh, folks would be interested in this. Um, we had uh, Susan Maynard here at our last meeting, and, and she was promoting uh, you know, the bike, um, uh, bike to work uh, day that's going to happen on the 8th. And if the Crocker Park Trail had a bike trail, similar to say, if you're at um, uh, the Camp Sawyer Trail, all right, where you can ride your bike and then on either side of the trail, there's uh, crushed granite. And so you get that, you know, the, the ability to walk in, on a soft surface and you're able to ride. And so, um, if I could make a recommendation, not so much to send it to these uh, committees and commissions, but to kind of like in the same uh, style that we've done our sustainability committee, in that uh, where we have a couple of council members and then we have a member of each advisory group, so that then you could have a committee that looks at it from all different angles, um, when you're also having some council input as well, so that then you could bring that um, you know back to the to the full council so um, I would be in favor of, of moving forward with uh, selling of this property and then uh, being able to use the money for either trail or, or uh, public land uh, purchase Terry <coughs> well I agree with um, what the other council members have said about um, it is our responsibility to do the right thing when it comes to public land and and that we do have that responsibility to you know look at at the good that we get from the sale or the retention um, personally on this I think that while the current condition of the property is low in habitat potential when you when you look at the big picture that the V ditch has a tremendous value and a tr tremendous um, opportunity for wetlands restoration for stormwater prevention for a buffer zone between a building site or a parking lot and the open space and I would be more inclined to allow a future development to be get a, a variance on parking requirements or for um, setback to be able to retain that buffer zone that we had a control over and more control than just oversight on the V-ditch maintenance but on the ability for whether it be the public or a citizens group or the city to be able to come in do some restoration that is meaningful and and allow for that buffer zone to be a buffer zone between that and the habitat area so while I don't think that we have the greatest opportunity to create the trail that goes through I think we do have an opportunity for the waterway and for the buffer zone and I would be more convinced to be in favor of this if we could change the parcel dynamics 
under the assumption that we would be able to get the needed change in building size for the owner of the property to do what he needed to do, but we could still have a functioning wetlands area that we could have control over. And so <coughs> that would be my wish, and, and I'm sorry that that's not what came across when I spoke about it two weeks ago, but I think that it's really important to maintain our control over the wetlands and the V-ditch possibilities. It is an area where the three canyons come together, so there's a reason we have the catchment basin there, because it is a high water area, and, and, and I think that there is some value to that. I could just ask a question then to follow up on what, mm. what Terry said. Ahead. So one of the questions I had I had asked um, city staff was about the, the detention basin and what would happen with that, whether, whether the city would still have access to that. And I believe the response was that we would have an easement to access the, the detention basin. Can you comment on that? Yes, ma'am. That's the whole purpose of the non-exclusive access easement to the detention basin <laughs> and then the exclusive storm drain <coughs> because there's we need to get access to it to clean it and maintain it and then coming out of the south end of that detention basin which no one sees except for me because it's underground there's a pipe that comes back across south hill so that's why there are those two easements that's why they were put into the agreement to, to follow up on on uh, council member lou's comments um looking at the um let's see if i can get the right picture up here Do we need magic hand for a photo for the public? I'm looking at you. The, oh. the northern area where the catchment basin is. What's, is, what's the uh, number on the Well, I, I didn't find three. the one I was looking at, but planning three. Planning three. Where we have the little indentation at the very, um, uh, I guess you'd call it the most east, easterly section. There's a little indentation on the, the map where the green the green is showing where the that's where we have the complete width of the access for maintenance of the catchment basin correct so it's that little indentation there's there are three arrows on that photo right and if you come over I'm putting my finger up to the screen, about a finger's width to the right of the rightmost arrow. There's that little indentation that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Sherry, move up just a little bit. There you go, right there, right above that uh, lovely painted fingernail. That's the indentation. That is the access easement to the detention basin. And, and my thought is that, you know, on that, where the proposed addition on that same map is, if we were to retain an easement, the width of where the proposed addition to the line where the V-ditch runs, that would, I think, um, give me more peace of mind. I'd, I'd point at my screen, but you guys can not see it. I, 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 I think... I think you're talking about the length, the length of it, the length of the V-ditch. The length of the parcel. Are we talking in here, ma'am? No, no, I think she's talking the whole length. The whole length of the V-ditch. The, the whole length of the V-ditch. So what is the nature of the easement we will be getting now? Mm. The nature of the easement we are getting now is access to the existing detention basin. Oh my. <coughs> so that's so let me slide <coughs> hang on <laughs> I didn't break that I promise yeah, I know Sherry's gonna abandon me with all electronic toys this is gonna be embarrassing that's all right you can point nah. so I'm a civil engineer not an electrical I can't so this is the access easement so it comes all the way over to here and then this area here is where the detention basin is. So this little cutout here actually is where the detention basin is underneath those trees. Sure. So they're, they're not going to own the detention basin. We retain that. 
the map. No, that it still doesn't. Uh, if I'm picking up what you're talking about, uh, is that the question is, you know, what is the nature of the easement from the catch basin all the way through the V ditch on this property here? The question is, 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 what would that easement allow the city to do uh, if they wanted to have different kinds of ideas of, on maintenance or you know, there are different ways to approach maintenance of such facilities? And obviously, um, so we don't have any native there, plants, so. or, or you know, you got this flow issue you were talking about, and sure. so if you could uh, kind of explain for those of us who are not sure what all that means. You know, what kinds of things could be done under the rules of the current easement that we would be getting if the property is so so we're not going to be getting an easement over the existing v ditch sir okay but that's the question th this is right so this is where the detention basin is right. this is hard to do when you're looking at it and trying to look at you too this is the access from the road right that's the access easement and then here there is a pipe easement this is where the pipe comes out of the, so all the flow is coming down the mountain. Right. The three watersheds that Mr. Hines talked about comes into this V-ditch. They come into this detention basin and settle, and then there's an underground pipe that goes across the road this way, right. which actually feeds into this V-ditch that's, that's over here. Okay. Um, exhibit E1 has a really good picture. I'm happy to share mine if you need it. Um, it's in the actual contract. Sure, that'd be lovely. And uh, that shows the actual change of easement, I believe. I'm sure that might be helpful. Right, that's the access easement. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, the little, mm -hmm. the little. Let me, put, let me put the two photos up side, side, side by side. Little shape right there. See if this. Let me see if this helps or just makes it more confusing. So, I thought I was losing my eyes and I realized Sherry was adjusting the focal length. So, this point here is this point here. And what it's showing is that we this, we are getting a non-exclusive access easement over. This piece of land is not being sold. That little square is this little square here. And the reason we're getting such a big non-exclusive access easement here is that when we need to get into the detention basin, we need to access it with equipment. Frequently we're in there with a backhoe, we're in there with trucks and such, so we need an area to dump the spoils and such. So that's what that's for. This piece here that isn't shown on this easement, on this exhibit, is where the exclusive storm drain pipe easement is, which is when I was talking in this photo, which is where the pipe goes out and it crosses under South Hill. I think that just makes it, I think it just makes it clear when you're asking what portion of the property we actually had an easement on. Right. It's very limited and for a very limited scope. It's not really to be able to do any meaningful work on the um, V ditch to restore it as a wetlands or any of those kind of uses. And, and like I said, I, I would be more if we were able to get an easement that ran the V ditch, I would be more um, inclined, inclined to, to be able to say that that could constitute some of the green space or the uh, water, you know, somehow to make it still feasible to build what the owner needs to build. Make some allowances for that to be able to get a larger easement I, I understand I think I understand the question you're asking ma'am and I'm gonna refer this back again to John because if I understand what you're suggesting you're suggesting that if that either we retain that we retain some right in the agreement to access the V ditch and modify it and in exchange for that we allow them to reduce the area of their land that they're required to plant so maybe the planning director might want to talk about what that impact is and where it would take away from screening 
Uh, well, I'm not saying necessarily parking. It might be parking reduction. It might, I mean, and, and there's got to be a creative way to do that kind of thing, to be able to retain some access easement besides just that one critical area that we need to retain. Except that you're asking for it in a very specific place, ma'am. I mean, because, right, you want it in the V-ditch. So we've got to try and figure out a way to put it in the V-ditch. And along the V-ditch is where the applicant, as you can see from some of his submittals, has proposed the parking that's required to be. And some of that parking is conditioned by city ordinance. Some of that parking is conditioned by his needs of how many employees he has on the site. That's true. Um, and, and, but again, you know, they, he can't park his vehicles in the V-ditch. Correct. That's it, correct. It is, right. you know, is, I won't say useless land because we're discussing it, so it's not useless. So, <clears throat> Terry, let me let me ask you then uh, for clarification. You're saying we retain the V-ditch? Either retain the V-ditch or retain the easement over the V-ditch where we don't just have the rights to say you need to keep it clear or you need to keep it full. That we actually yeah. have some um, say so. Say so, and that would mean some access. Th that would seem to be, and I'm going to look to you, David, <clears throat> something uh, the legal language that you can go back and inspect it is basically what you're saying, or you would have some kind of say so over, hey, we would like to see these plants in the V ditch or something. Or we or could, whatever. or we could say, we're going to come in and plant it. Right. Plant yeah. Right. And that could be part of the remediation of, of uh, slowing down the flow of water um, that would go into our stormwater system. It could be. I mean, and, and I'm not saying... I'm not trying to get creative here, Randy. Well, I think what Councilmember O'Connell is trying to reserve is this goes back to our plan about having V-Creeks. And, it, and it's a conversation that I've had with multiple people on Mountain Watch. And, and as I said before, in general, I think it's a good idea that we use natural means to try and control water and to try and enhance water quality. So if I, if I hear her correctly, she'd like the city to have the right but not the duty to go back into that V-ditch to take out some of the natives and to perhaps enhance it. And, and, I, and I may have remarked earlier that I thought that I, I think the applicant would not have an objection to that of saying that, look, to the extent that it doesn't increase their future maintenance costs. Right. So if we were to say we want to go back in, and I don't know if that's something you want me to take two minutes and explore with the applicant now. Just my, my, my concern, I think, with the applicant is that they've been working on this for a couple of years now. Uh, they've certainly been to multiple hearings. It sounds like we are really close. And if, if perhaps we could take a couple of minutes and maybe yeah. with the applicant and uh, with the city attorney, we might be able to come up with some language that would satisfy you, that would satisfy all, if that's the council's pleasure, if it's in their Well, I, yeah, you know, I mean, it, it, yeah, certainly, I mean, you know, really right now, the way this sits, I haven't said anything, but, uh, you know, listening to my colleagues, uh, as is, it, it would be four to one. But I, I think with any decision, you really want to try and get 5-0 and try and get the best that you can get out of it, you know, to, to see. So, I mean, we'd like to address Terry's concerns. You know, I happen to agree with what some of the stuff that she's saying, you know, that if, and if we can and, and the applicant's amenable to it and you guys can come up with some kind of language where it's not going to uh, put the burden on there, I think that that's, you know, uh, a good a good way to go. <clears throat> Would you consider a short recess until so, 9.30? Sure, and it, could I just make one comment yeah. before the recess? You know, one of the requested changes that we had last time was that we wanted to have the city's ability to approve of any, you know, work or a any removal of any um, vegetation in the V-Ditch, and that was written into the agreement when it was, when it was revised. So um, I'm wondering if that is sufficient, or it sounds like you want more... We have, More I think that. the way that the agreement looks to me now, we would have the the authority to say, we like the way the V-ditch is, or you need to remove vegetation, or you need to, uh, I don't think we could say add vegetation, but we needed, we, we have the thing to say, 
point at it and say you need to maintain this to our standards well and I, I think Randy's point is is if it's not costing him any more money than and to do right it. yeah and and, and, so that, and my thought is that kind of we would want to be able to point at it and say we'd like to come in and do some stormwater management here at our level instead of and and that's a more reasonable way of approaching it so I mean not put the onus out um, just quick clarification on that I think we can probably uh, take a, a a recess and let everybody get together and talk about it I think we're close to resolution here um, is you know like the rain garden we have out in front here and that's used to filter water absolutely like yes, that. Sir. Is, is that kind of the goal of prior to the detention basin with some of the planning is that you know and I don't know we haven't seen it, it maybe I'm way ahead there it is a serendipitous unintended consequence it's just from a lack of maintenance that that the ditch got overgrown like that and it just turns out to be a beautiful thing that it right has the water I mean quality. <laughs> going forward though I mean with the well, going forward, will plan be to going forward. There's a requirement on site for them to develop it to meet the board, and I think what the language we are trying to propose to to, uh, to assist Council Member O'Connell with this is to allow us to go back in the V ditch and do that as well. Right. The property is already going to have to do it as part of this. They're already going to have to manage their flow, and I think Council Member O'Connell would like us to go back and to be able to manage this V ditch, this concrete V ditch, in addition. To the flow-based treatment there. And it may not happen. I mean, we may it couldn't, you're right. go on to something else. But I, I would like that opportunity that if we can. Okay. I, I think I think we're clear as mud here. So, <laughs> so. I, I feel like I've got good direction. Now, so I understand okay. it. I think it's great. All right. No, I think and let, let's take a break and then let you guys work your magic and go do other things. So take take about five or ten minutes. Thank you. Second. Um, that makes sense. I, I, I like where you're coming from. Yeah. And, and, and. Thank you.